I'm Jane Buxton and I'm a professor and the MPH practicum director in the School of Population and Public Health and harm reduction lead at the BC Centre for Disease Control. I'm going to talk today about mixed methods research and I'd like to start by sharing how my appreciation for the different types of research has developed over the years. After seven years as a principal in family practice in the UK, I came to Canada and needed to spend time as a resident to become licensed, and hence I found myself in the mid-1990s doing a master's degree. When I came out of the program, thinking quantitative research was the only way to go, to find the truth and create knowledge needed evidence, and the way to get the evidence was through quantitative research. During my residency, I was fortunate enough to be introduced to qualitative research by some excellent professors in the School of Nursing. Later, as I began working with marginalised populations such as people who have been infected by hepatitis C and people who use drugs, I realised who the real experts were and the importance of a qualitative approach in all aspects of programme planning, evaluation and research. Hence I began to combine qualitative and quantitative methods to get a more comprehensive perspective of each issue which I now know and work as mixed methods. Mixed methods takes the advantage of using multiple ways to explore a research programme. I'll give you a brief overview of what you're likely to have learned already from the quantitative and the qualitative modules that you've already seen, and to give you some context to mixed methods research design and then hopefully bring it all to life with some real life examples. So to start with, I'll talk about frameworks to guide study design around the knowledge claims, strategies of inquiry, specific methods used, and then to talk about the theory of mixed methods research de design, namely a definition, why it's used, and some design strategies. And as I said, follow with some examples. As Creswell points out, that in quantitative study, the research starts with a problem statement and then moves on to the hypothesis, research question, and designs the study. With qualitative study, researchers usually start with the purpose of the study. And as we'll discuss, we'll go into it in more detail with mixed methods. When considering um, the framework and the, the methods to use, one will look at what knowledge claims are made by the researcher, what strategies of inquiry and general procedures will be used? What is the specific methods of data collection, analysis and writing? So starting with what knowledge claims are made by the researcher. Um, so starting with the knowledge claims, um, without getting too philosophical, the assumptions that will include paradigms, so that's sets of, sets of concepts, theories, epistemology, how do we know, and ontology, what is knowledge? So the assumptions that researchers start with about how and what they will learn during their inquiry. So po post-positive um, is really looking at the scientific method, the deterministic approach and the reductionist approach, testing small discrete ideas and developing hypotheses and research questions, often holding things constant and looking at just small um, interventions or things that may actually be making a difference. Socially constructed knowledge, knowledge claims or social constructivism looks at how people understand the world they live in and develop subjective meaning. It's very complex and the meaning is negotiated socially and historically. So in other words, people form these meanings through their interactions with others and with experiences. Next is the advocacy and the participatory knowledge claims. What we know is that with post-positivism, it imposes structural laws that don't fit with marginalised individuals or groups or addresses issues of social justice. And by including the voices of the individuals, it can address issues of disempowerment, inequality, oppression, and the voices of the participants become a united voice for reform and change. And examples of this are the feminist, uh, racialized discourses, queer theory, and so on. And finally, there's the pragmatic knowledge. 
And this arises out of actions, situations and consequences, and it opens the door to different forms of data collection and analysis in mixed method study. So the second of the elements is what strategies of inquiry and general procedures will be used. And we can look at the quantitative, the qualitative and the mixed methods as different strategies of inquiry. The quantitative, we look at experimental design, and this can be the random assignment of subjects, or a non-experimental design, such as cross-sectional or longitudinal surveys. Qualitative focuses on context and meanings, and it may be there's a, a large number of different strategies that can be used, and I've just listed here narratives, ethnogra ethnographies, grounded theory and case studies. But the methods used to collect the data may be in-depth interviews, focus groups, ethno ethnographic observations and document review. So how does one choose what study design to use? And of course it depends upon the research problem. For example, you use quantitative if you're identifying factors that influence an outcome um, and understand predictors or determining which intervention works best. You would use qualitative if it's useful to explore a concept or a phenomena that you know little about. And mixed methods can capture both quantitative and qualitative approaches. And it explores generally to find out what variables to study, then do a survey, or to do the survey and then follow up with individuals to explore why the results. So a definition of mixed methods research is it's a methodology for conducting research that involves collecting, analysing and integrating quantitative and qualitative research in a single study or longitudinal programme of inquiry. In combination, it can provide a better understanding of a research problem or issue than either of the research approaches alone. There's been general consensus over time that it's no longer a quantitative versus a qualitative methods. There's a common understanding in research world that both are necessary. As Trokin says, any kind of polarised debate has become less than productive and it obscures the fact that qualitative and quantitative data are intimately related to each other. All quantitative data is based on qualitative judgments and all qualitative data can be described and manipulated numerically. Brewer suggests that mixed methods will attack the research programme with an arsenal of methods that have non-overlapping weaknesses, in addition to complementary strengths. So why should we use mixed methods designs? In what situations? So really, to put it very simply, it's to overcome the limitations of a single design. And more specifically, when variations in data collection lead to greater validity. If one methodology doesn't provide all of the information or has limitations, different perspectives can help explain and interpret the results and complement the strengths and overcome the weaknesses of a single design. It can explore a phenomena and serve as a theoretical perspective and it's useful to develop and validate a new instrument. It's also useful when unexpected results arise from a prior study and you want to find out more about why this may have happened. It also reduces researchers' pre-existing assumptions and biases. Often in qualitative research, we talk about bracketing, about the researcher coming with, pre, pre, um, with ideas and biases that are already there. And this really helps to be, the quantitative um, addition helps this to be, uh, the biases to be reduced. So, as often occurs in research, there's a variety of frameworks that are used and may have different nomenclature, which develop over time, either as people put their own spin on an existing framework or as experts in the field refine their own frameworks. On a previous slide under mixed method, I listed sequential, concurrent and embedded. And here are three different types of sequential design. The first one, you can see which starts with quantitative data is called explanatory design so a sequential explanatory design you start with the quantitative data and and results and then you can follow up with qualitative inquiry 
as to explain why you have seen some of these results. And then you interpret the two together um, and have your, your final um, results that you're able to explain. The next that is shown here is the sequential exploratory design. So for example, you want to explore an issue through a survey, but you're not sure what are the right questions to ask. It's useful for developing and testing a new instrument. And then you can do the quantitative, do the instrument following, and then you interpret the two, can interpret the two together. Sequential can also be transformative and either can come first and the results are integrated into the interpretation phase and can be analysed together. And sometimes people will talk about sandwiching. So you might start with a quantitative, do some qualitative exploration and then end up with another quantitative portion. And similarly you can start qualitative, quantitative and then explore some of the findings that you've had in that quantitative data. So other mixed methods designs, one is called concurrent, um, it's also known as convergent or parallel. So a researcher combines both the quantitative and qualitative together, which are collected at the same time, emerging the data and comparing the results. Different methods can be used to confirm, cross-validate or corroborate findings, such as methods overcoming a weakness using one method with strengths of another. Sometimes people talk about it being dominant or less dominant as the secondary method plays a smaller role. So if it's mainly a quantitative study, then that would be the dominant part with the qualitative being less dominant. Embedded or nested design can provide new insights or more refined thinking. It may be convergent or sequential. Qualitative may be used prior to the intervention to determine recruitment strategies, for example or as shown here, qualitative is embedded within the intervention. For example, part of the quantitative uh, study is to understand how participants experience the intervention or the treatment. So of course there are challenges with mixed methods design. It may take considerable time and resources to actually do it. Um, it may take longer, it may take more personnel. The skills of the researcher need to be varied or there needs to be a research team such that it can be complementary and that people have research skills in both the quantitative and the qualitative design. The findings may be found to conflict or be contradictory and there's a need to resolve the discrepancies between the different types of data. It may also generate unequal evidence where one is more prominent than the other. It can also be difficult to decide when to proceed in the sequential design and what results from the first phase should be followed up in the second phase. This is known as the point of interface. I find it may be difficult to publish due to word and page limits, to, so combining both the quantitative and qualitative results can lead to a fairly extensive and large manuscript. Sometimes it can be helpful to actually look at evaluating a mixed method study. So one of the ways of doing it is just looking at these criteria. Are you collecting both quantitative and qualitative data? And are you employing rigorous procedures in the methods of both the, the data collection and the analysis? Are you mixing and or integrating, merge, embed or connect the two sources of data? so that their combined use provides a much better understanding of the research problem than the one source or the other. If you use mixed methods research design and integrate all features of the study within the design and convey research terms consistent with those being used in the mixed method field. And that is taken from Creswell and Planer Clark. So to try and illustrate and give you an example of um, some which mixed method uh, design to use. I have a couple of examples here. Firstly, this is a, they're both ones that I have been involved in. This one is about prion disease testing in the laboratory. As you probably know, prion diseases such, a, such as creutzfeldt jakob disease are characterized by rapidly progressive dementia. It's untreatable and it's invariably fatal. In Canada, there's about 30 to 40 cases of CJD identified annually. 
However, in medical laboratories, they process hundreds of specimens every year where prion disease is in the differential diagnosis and tests are required to be performed to rule out other potentially treatable neurologic illnesses, viral encephalitis and other such. However, there were no national laboratory guidelines for handling prions and although no cases of CJD had been transmitted during specimen processing, laboratory workers may be reluctant to handle and process these specimens resulting in test delays. So to what sort of study do we need to do to, we know that if we can identify and address the concerns related to the reluctance to perform tests, we can probably reduce the delays in testing and patients receive appropriate management in a more timely fashion. But we don't know what the concerns are of the laboratory workers, who it is that has the concerns, is it people who are working on the lab, is it the managers? How prevalent are the concerns? Is this just a few people or is it the majority? And what can be done about it? So the question is, what sort of study is appropriate? So we decided to do a sequential exploratory mixed methods design. So I put the diagram back up of how it's qualitative data, quantitative data leading to the interpretation. So we decided to do semi-structured interviews with a variety of people from different lab types of labs and different levels of jobs um, and we did we had 12 people and we kept us we kept um, enrolling new people until we had saturation so as you are aware with qualitative data no new things were emerging the interviews were audio tape transcribed and we used en vivo to organize the data we used the, the coding process as it always is an iterative process but we used um, a construct, a framework of the health belief model as the overarching theme and the framework. And this is adapted from Nutbeam. So you can see we started with the semi-structured interviews and focus groups to explore what the knowledge and attitudes and beliefs about prions of people who worked in the laboratories was. From that, we developed a draft quest questionnaire and create, which was created. We used um, the survey, the draft survey was modified using a Delphi process. So Delphi process is really, you s enroll experts, you send them the questions. In this case, we gave them a three-point Likert scale of keep, maybe, or remove. And then to ask them to provide input about what was missing, what other wording suggestions, and the responses were collated by the moderator and then it was sent back out. This is a way of avoiding a dominance of one person's point of view who may be seen as the expert or may just have a dominant personality. With the, um, the draft questionnaire we ordered the questions around the workflow in the medical lab. So receiving the specimen, processing and decontamination of the workspace. So it was a logical flow. It also included knowledge questions about prion transmission and personal protective equipment. So we sent out the, the survey um, and we had 426 usable results. And just very briefly, a third of those who responded reported specimens were not properly labelled. Half experienced anxiety processing the specimens over half reported that they'd had received no specific training. We also found that knowledge was significantly higher in those who had training, not surprisingly, and that over 80% would be more comfortable with national guidelines. So what that told us um, really was that there were areas that we could um, in, intervene to improve people's confidence in working but before we started, we didn't really know what the issues were and what the questions were. So I'll go on to a second study, which is about issues of homelessness and housing on prison release. So this was a study that was done in the context of participatory research, which was occurring in a women's provincial correctional facility in BC. As, as everyone knows, housing is a basic determinant of health and homelessness may negatively influence health and well-being, crime and incarceration. 
We'd heard concerns about the lack of housing being available on release and the potential of homelessness leading to reincarcerations. So we wanted to find out what were the issues, who faces the challenges, what can we do about them. So we thought about what study was appropriate. And there are a fair amount of uh, people are in provincial corrections where this was performed are actually in corrections for a fairly short time. So it seemed more sensible to actually collect the qualitative and the quantitative data at the same time. So we use the convergent um, mixed method design. We developed a self-administered questionnaire, or in fact it was the prisoner participatory health research team that developed it, and included quantitative questions and open-ended questions to allow free qualitative text to illuminate the main survey responses. It was sent out to the women who were in the prison at the time and there was 83 women that completed the survey for a 72% response rate. 63% reported finding housing upon release was a problem for them and 34% had a desire to relocate to another city. It was obvious that homelessness was a barrier to employment and by using some of the qualitative, it helped to explain, I had nowhere to live, so I was not able to gain employment, therefore I stole someone's money to survive. So it was a barrier to, imp to actually being employed, but also it led to uh, a criminal activity. Women indicated that a success successful housing plan should incorporate fle flexible, progressive staged housing. So it wasn't one size fits all, people needed different things depending on where they were in their lives and their family situation. Uh, we have another example here. We found in the quantitative study of the 71 people who had been previously incarcerated, 56% stated that homelessness contributed to their uh, return to crime. And I, there's a couple of quotes that I have here that I'd like to share with you, which really expands on not just the numbers, but it gives context, it gives a story to why this happens. Without a place to go, desperation takes over, that or fear. Gotta do what you gotta do to survive. You need money to, for a place to sleep and food. You turn to crime to survive, you live day to day. If I had my own home, I would have felt some of the security I had before I left jail. And the next uh, quote is, not having anywhere to go took me back to where I knew the people. Once you're there, the lifestyle compensates for any feelings or feelings of belonging. You drown yourself in drugs to not feel. Then you need to support that habit to stay numb and start selling dope or your body. So I think you can see how in that last study, the qualitative uh, context really enriched the, the quantitative and gave it, gave it more life, gave it more meaning. So in summary, you conduct a mixed method study when you have both quantitative and qualitative data, and both types of data together provide a better understanding of your research problem than either type by itself. Mixed methods research is a good design to use if you're seeking to build on the strengths of both qualitative and quantitative data. The design may be sequential, explanatory, exploratory or embedded, or it may be concurrent, also known as parallel or convergent, and again it may be embedded. And these are some of the references, including the two studies um, that were mentioned uh, that I gave as examples. Thank you.